I think some of the um, two of the reasons that a forum is slightly different to a uh, devotional is that you get the chance to hear something a little more um, secular, perhaps, and and I want to relate the secular with the sacred but also that you have the chance sometimes to hear from outsiders. And you may think from the tones that you're hearing that I'm an outsider, but um, at least for the last five years I've been permitted to think at least that I'm an insider. <clears throat> in a BYU devotional address entitled A Child of God, given, in, given on October the 21st, 1997, Elder Henry B. Eyring described the characteristics of a good learner. He entered into his thesis by discussing the effect of pride upon an excellent learner. At one point he said, and I quote, I will tell you that not only can you pursue educational excellence and humility at the same time to avoid spiritual danger, but that the way to humility is also the doorway to educational excellence. The best antidote I know for pride also can produce in us the characteristics that lead to excellence in learning, end of quote. In this statement, there is a sense that pride and excellence in learning are mutually exclusive, in the same way that pride and humility are mutually exclusive, and that humility and excellence in learning are mutually dependent. Of course, it makes sense. The basis of learning is the process that is first manifest by a question. To even ask the question, usually one acknowledges that there is a deficiency in one's own knowledge or experience and that there are external sources that possess that knowledge or experience that will be identified and from which one will seek, even plead to know. The personal state from which those acknowledgements and the question emerges is at the least a mild state of humility, and it implies that our minds are sufficiently open and receptive that we will accept the response not knowing beforehand what it contains those who ask the question and who, because of their expertise in a discipline, already assume they know the answers, block the possibility of real discovery and accelerated progress. The more questions one asks and the more frequently questions are asked, the more one is naturally inquisitive. One's mind and heart are naturally open to new knowledge and experience. It becomes a state of being. But this conversation is not unusual to you. It happens often on Sundays and in religion classes and many times in between. We talk in these terms as we refer to our attempts to seek the Holy Ghost in the critical and also the incidental decisions of our lives. I've come to believe a number of principles about our association with the Spirit. I believe that the Spirit is and can be operative in our lives in many different ways, only some of which are accompanied by an emotional response. From this I believe that the gift of the Holy Ghost is more literal in the sense of its constant companionship than often we permit ourselves to believe. Depending upon the condition of our hearts, I believe that the Spirit is active in our lives without there being a defined problem or decision at stake. And I also believe in the dichotomy that the workings of the Spirit are often much slower than we would have them be and many times more efficient than we can imagine them to be. The Spirit is the constant courier and confirmer of our Heavenly Father's deep and intimate love for us and of his desire for our return to him and capacity to provide every assistance imaginable for it to occur. But for a moment I want to consider the times when we have a question and we are seeking our Heavenly Father's response via the Spirit. There are those times when the question one asks deserves a swift and clear response. Within the first few months of our marriage, my wife Jan made an appointment to visit one of her friends during the day while I was at school. The plan was that she would drive into the city of Sydney with me and drop me at the school. She would then take the car across the Sydney Harbour Bridge to the North Shore and visit with her friend, leaving in time to pick me up at the end of my classes and return home together. As I was pacing the floor in the foyer of the school's main building, with the arranged time having passed by 20 minutes or more earlier, I was worried and I needed to know of her condition. When the day began, it was clear and sunny. Now night had fallen, a terrible storm was underway with lightning, thunder and heavy rain, and the traffic on the harbour bridge was in chaos. There, as I was pacing, I said a silent prayer and asked my father what her condition was. Immediately, I had a dramatic response. 
Four clear and pronounced words entered into my head. The words were, hey man, she's okay. <clears throat> now you need to know that I was in art school and it was the early 1970s. I learned that day that when necessary, the spirit will communicate in language that clearly we will understand. <laughs> Only minutes later, Jan arrived and she was okay. But the occasions when these kinds of questions are asked and immediate, res immediate clear responses given are not common. Mostly I have a question that comes as a consequence of a problem or a desire, and I pray about it and ponder it over a time. These are the situations that are the most complex and sensitive to consider. Not with any desire to define a formula, but with an interest in observing the conditions and the process, I think normally this is what happens to me. The conditions of my mind and heart bring me to a point where I can articulate a question which I pose to my Heavenly Father, discussing its contexts and significance. Almost at the same time, I seek for immediate responses, quick, momentary impressions that seem to come from beyond my intellectual and emotional frame. I try to keep my mind and heart as open as I can because I cannot anticipate the form or the message of the response. Immediate impressions are not frequent, but they do come, and I've learned not to rationalize them away. Normally, however, the question is asked, and I wait and ponder. I explore my senses for suggestions and ideas. I explore the question in its context, the reasons that have given rise to the question, the nature of the problem and its effect upon me, the possible solutions and their implications. Perhaps I have configured the problem under certain prejudices and alternatives need to be considered. Throughout this broadly ranging, soul-searching, open-minded exploration, I desire intently to know what is right for me and I seek for any intellectual or emotional sense or impression that seems not to be of my initiative and that seems to bear positively on the question. I've learned that the spirit speaks quietly and subtly in often unpredictable forms. As the impressions come, the process of interpretation intensifies. I search for meaning from these impressions as I test them against my question and the context that I've been exploring. I search for reason and a sense of application, of cause and effect, of confirmation of my tentative interpretation. I search for possible paths and solutions in accordance with the impression and I ask if I'm on the right track. Sometimes I test my interpretation against alternatives to see if the original sense is strengthened or if it is diminished. If it is diminished, then I test the alternative likewise in order to see if I'm over-rationalizing. In the end, I settle with an interpretation that remains open and contingent, and I move forward with faith. At times, I even pray for the Spirit to block me if I have misinterpreted the impressions. It is in this area of interpretation that the greatest risk occurs. Once, when my family and I were camping with friends, the ranger came to pass a message to us that our dog was in the, that was in the care of Jan's sister Susan had run away from her house in the middle of a storm and they couldn't find him. Rebecca, our second eldest daughter, who was 10 or 11 years old then, was deeply troubled by the thought of our little dog alone without care. She was so concerned that she re decided to return home early with some of our friends, the Duns, who lived near Susan, and stay with them until the dog had been found. After she arrived at the Duns' home, now feeling a little homesick in an unfamiliar environment away from her family, she prayed to know if our dog was safe. She received a calm and assuring feeling that confirmed for her and for us that the dog was alive and well. This assurance stayed with her and gave her strength sufficient to be away from us over the period. Our family returned home a few days later and still the dog was not found, but Rebecca was confident that all was well. I went to the Dunn's home to bring Rebecca back to us, and while I was there, Susan called to tell me that the dog had been found. It had died from being hit by a car some days earlier. As I was driving home with Rebecca, I told her of the telephone call. When she knew the story, she was doubly distraught. She was so upset that our dog had died and, and had not been cared for, and she felt that Heavenly Father had deceived her. 
She did not doubt the assurance that she had felt from the Spirit that night, but she felt that she had been deceived. As we worked through her feelings in the car and later with Jan at home, we all came to another conclusion. Our Heavenly Father loves Rebecca immensely. He did not want her to be distraught. He wanted her to be assured that the God of this world, who knows when each sparrow falls, loves her and is caring for her and for our dog, but not necessarily as we had thought. But how is he to tell her of the subtle details of the dog's condition? How is he to protect Rebecca's feelings and still allow the passage of mortality to transpire for this little creature? He didn't deceive Rebecca. He gave to her the only true feeling that accommodated both situations and protected her from the details of the situation until she was back with her family in the secure context of home. The only contingency was the capacity of Rebecca and her parents to interpret the message of the Spirit as it, was, as it was delivered to her that night and as it had persisted. I begin my presentation today with this discussion because I believe that the pursuit of meaning or knowledge in this life has the same general characteristics whether the source from which one is seeking is the Spirit or another. It involves humility, a truly open mind and careful consideration of all the factors and contexts. I also believe that for one who is baptized, whose heart is open, the spirit can be involved in that pursuit, whether it is spiritual or secular in nature, and whether or not the spirit is being sought consciously. With this as context, I will turn to something that might appear to be unrelated to that context. The idea and definition of a work of art are not concepts that have been fixed through time. These concepts have been evolving steadily, changing a little more slowly than people can see in their lives, except for the dramatic sea changes that occur once every century or two. But these changes, persistent or radical, are not unique to art. They are rooted deeply in society itself and in its intellectual and cultural behavior. Art does not simply document or comment on change, Art provides a critique that foregrounds ch the character of and motivation for the change that causes society to see it more clearly. Let me show you what I mean. About 170 years ago, the principal subjects of significant art in the Western world were the vignettes and moments of everyday life, the landscapes of the fields close to the villages, the activities of the workers, the social settings of street scenes, but it is important to remember that these common yet idealized pictures also represented a fundamental shift in the definition and social role of art. Art only recently had received the authority to break from the political and religious narrative and analysis and to focus on the common person, their contexts and activities. By this shift, artists were free from the oppressive patronage of institution and aristocracy free to determine the nature of the outcome of their pursuits. One hundred years later, towards the end of a violent succession of short-lived reactive movements that are called collectively modernism, art had lost its relationship with the contexts within which it functioned. Metaphorically and ironically speaking, artists were free to lock themselves in their white studios, separated from the polluting influences of social cause and effect to produce images, the subject of which simply was the language of art itself. The aspiration of art was the achievement of the purest, most essential form that could be defined. Finally, in 1961, that form was identified as being flatness. Art had also been drained of intellectual content and the only demands that it placed upon the viewer were time and emotion. One was supposed to stand before the work, empty their mind of information and idea, and gaze at it, nurturing the ineffable, psychological, or in art terms, aesthetic response that it intended to provoke. But how can a person empty their mind of information and idea and still know to gaze at the work and also know that their ambition is to search only for a psychological response from the work? It's impossible. It shows that the theory could not stand even on its own terms. Earlier, I claimed that art provided the critique that foregrounded social change. The 1950s and 60s is a volatile period in American social history, 
a period that could be argued as being one of the definition and dissolution of social theories. Now let's leap forward another 30 to 40 years and explore the nature of art in the last decade of the 20th century. Significant works of art at this time are fully connected to the social, political, cultural and geographical context from which they come. The principal intention of the work is to provoke the generation of discourse and meaning within the viewer. The material from which the work is made is selected and utilised by the artist because it best enables the artist to explore the intended meanings. The aesthetic or emotional dimension of the work is employed powerfully to reinforce its meanings. The work's scale, the nature of its presentation, the character of the space around it, indeed everything that falls within the viewer's field of vision are carefully considered as elements that strengthen the meanings and assist in the process of obtaining, obtaining them. I've been using the plural meanings because significant works of art aren't usually propaganda with a singular dogmatic meaning. A profound characteristic in these works of visual art is the allegorical complexity of meanings that are produced in the work and the way that these allegories surround an important thesis but never fix it the viewer is always free to consider the work from their particular frames of reference and explore the work according to their terms. But it is important to note that while the viewer is free to interpret at will, almost always the signs and significations of the work lead the viewer to consider ideas and feelings that are related to its intended meanings. In the end, significant works of art now ask more questions than they answer but the questions all revolve around the thesis that the artist intended for the work. Let me give you three examples. The first is entitled Ghost and is a work made in 1989 by the British artist Rachel Whiteread. It is the object at the left of the slide. If one looks carefully at the object, one sees that it has the imprint of, Victorian, of a Victorian era door towards one edge. It also contains the imprint of other architectural details from the same era. On the opposite side of the object, one sees the imprint of a fireplace. These are negative imprints of the architectural forms, not a sculpture of the form itself. When one considers these facts carefully, one understands that White Reed made a direct plaster cast of a particular room. She did not sculpt this form out of a block of plaster, but simply and carefully made a cast of the interior, the space of the room. The plaster therefore occupies the same space as the human occupants did, but what does it mean? Situated in the Charles Saatchi Gallery in London, when poorer, cramped tenement dwellings were being bought up by wealthy design agencies, architects, accountants and lawyers, and the occupants were being relocated to sterile new towns beyond the cultural contexts that they grew up in, this object brings to the mind memories of media reports and discussions of the pain of this kind of displacement. This object does not dictate a particular message about the process, but it triggers personal reflection upon the condition itself. And due obviously to the specific nature of the room that is represented, powerful and specific ideas of the occupants who have been displaced emerged in, emerge in the imagination which deeply personalised the response of the viewer. The meaning of the work depends upon a carefully considered method of execution, presentation in a space coded for this kind of reflection, and a social context in which the conditions that, are, that the work is critiquing are alive. The second work was made by the Chilean artist Alfredo Yar in 1996 and was presented in the Australian National Gallery in 1999. I will tell you the name of the work in a few moments. We enter a space in which the walls are painted black. The two sources of light are the ceiling and a large table, both of which have evenly filtered white light emanating from them. On the table, we notice a mound of matter, the nature of which we don't understand until we move a little closer. At a point, suddenly we realize that the mound is comprised of tens of thousands of 35 millimeter slides. When we understand that fact, equally suddenly the light table itself takes meaning as the kind that photographers and publishers use to select images carefully for publication, with the exception that the table is much larger than one in normal use. Also, the nature of the space with its black walls reinforces the idea of a media room of some kind. 
As we approach the mound of slides with the hope of identifying what the slides contain, we are surprised to understand that each and every slide, every one of the tens of thousands of slides on the table have the same image, the eyes of a person who one identifies possibly as one who would not normally be found in a high-tech media room making decisions about images for consumption in a glossy journal. This mound of images now begins to represent the masses of humanity that are fed to us by the media, homogenized humanity, moving over the Earth's landscape without identity, personality, and real experience, displaced by war and famine, and living in mass camps that are equally homogenized. The media presents this aspect of humanity in a manner that makes it difficult for us, who have great means and real experience, to have any empathy of, of any significant degree. But these eyes belong to a person. Her name is Gotete Emerita. The work is called The Eyes of Gotete Emerita, and the text that accompanies the work helps us understand that she is a specific person with specific experience. She is a Rwandan Tutsi whose husband and two sons, aged seven and ten, were killed by the Hutu rebels in front of her eyes and her daughters. Now these eyes, and the eyes of every person represented in that mass of humanity, has real experience. They have identity, personality, and passion. And now we can have real empathy for each one of them as our sister or brother. The last work was completed only a few months ago and is now in the collection of the BYU Museum of Art. The artist's name is Brian Kashisnik, who lives in Kenosh, Utah, and the work is called Sleeping Musicians. In this case, the work is a painting 7 foot 10 inches by 9 foot 5 inches in size. As a painting, it refers to a long conservative tradition, emphasized further by the painted banner that it contains its title written in Latin. With this tradition subtly in our minds, we view the work with some dignity and reserve, slightly detached as we would be from a large painting in the Louvre or the National Gallery. We observe on the painting surface the simplified image of three people, two women and a man, who are in, this, in a state of rest, their different musical instruments and notations laid aside. The simplified style of painting somehow makes each one of these figures seem as though they might represent each one of us, and the landscape might represent any pleasant place in which we might be located. But then the painting's label makes reference to the scriptures that speak of the Saviour's three closest apostles who accompanied him to the garden and were asked to watch while the most profound and significant event ever undertaken in the history of the world began. But they slept, and it passed by them. Was it ignorance, lack of discipleship, or exhaustion that brought the sleep about? And what about our discipleship? When do we sleep? What instruments do we lay aside? These simple explorations into meaning are at the beginning of a path which leads to further and further subtleties and more and more profound values and meanings. At this point, three principles are important to, to stress. Firstly, by implication, I've been describing art in the late 20th and early 20th, 21st centuries as being a means to explore and articulate ideas involving subjects as broad and numerous as there are subjects. And I propose that for the special kinds of knowledge and experiences that are to be gained, the profoundly synthetic and non-linear relational ideas that are to be received, there is no other way satisfactorily to explore them than from art. The viewing of art is profoundly interdisciplinary, and naturally we apply this process of viewing to all works of art, not just contemporary works, by asking the simple question, what does it mean, and rigorously exploring our responses. Secondly, the point at which we stand in the historical progression of society and of art validates the search for personal and social meaning in the most open and complete way. Art now incorporates broad possibilities to explore important issues and truths integrated with the intellectual and psychological freedom to utilize the widest range of methods and media, both to articulate and to receive these meanings. Of course, some artists are exploiting these methods and media to explore ideas that are profoundly offensive to the spirit, seducing the open-minded into rationalizing evil and sin as being good and important. We must be careful and highly sensitive to these assaults upon our minds and hearts, protecting our sensitivities in order to use them to receive truly valuable thoughts and concepts. 
And thirdly, the procedure that enables us to search for meaning is profoundly similar to the humble, delicate, and open-minded procedure that enables us to interpret the impressions that we receive from the spirit. It is one that begins with the identification of an intellectual and or emotional response to the, the questions we ask ourselves. Then our minds and hearts are energized in a speculative and broadly ranging process that begs us to explore every aspect of the work, its presentation, and the physical and intellectual context in which we're located. We explore all the metaphors and allegorical frames that we can. We search through our intellect and our psychology, turning over our life's experiences and the knowledge that has gradually accumulated, looking for relationships and contexts of meaning. Our minds and hearts are kept open to identify new possibilities and propositions. This search for knowledge is integrated, relevant, relational, and meaningful. And for those who are humble, whose desire is for eternal life, whose faith in the atonement is operative, and who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. This procedure can and will include spiritual influences, preparing us, and from Doctrine and Covenants 88, in all things when I shall send you again to magnify the calling whereunto I have called you and the mission with which I have commissioned you. So what is the BYU Museum of Art, and what role does it play in the pursuit of knowledge? It might be interesting for you to know that the BYU Museum of Art is one of the 10 largest university art museums in the United States. And according to state government figures in 2000, it appears to be one of the 10 most visited places in Utah, including Zions Park and Temple Square. About two thirds of the museum is never seen by those who visit to explore the exhibition and or to eat at the cafe. These spaces are for storage of art, registration, photography, design, fabrication, framing, exhibition preparation, security, and administration. At any one time and under normal circumstances, the museum presents five or six exhibitions concurrently. Only some of these exhibitions are drawn from the more than 16,500 works of art that are in the museum's collection. Most are drawn from collections throughout the United States and all over the world. For example, a little over a week ago, we closed a wonderful exhibition that came to us from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, entitled Lure of the West. In August, we will open a spectacular exhibition of Ottoman art called Empire of the Sultans that is coming from a large private collection in London. And given our discussion of contemporary art a little later in 2003, we will present three major exhibitions of contemporary art that will be drawn from artists and collections throughout the United States and overseas. We also hold national symposia on a broad range of art-related issues. Our last symposium explored the relationship between art and tourism with leading scholars in the field. Almost everything that we do, every exhibition, every conference and symposium, every performance, every activity, almost every one of these are free to the BYU community. And where they cannot be because of the size of the budget that is demanded to present them, there are substantial discounts to the BYU community. With this in mind, it is also important that you know that the BYU Museum of Art is not funded from university budget allocations. When the museum was first proposed, the university's board of trustees agreed to its construction, maintenance and operation on condition that no tithing funds would be used. Thus, all of our work is paid for from the funds that come from the generous donations of the museums and the university's friends. But this information does not answer the question of the function of the BYU Museum of Art. Knowledge and meaning are obtained from works of art by sensitive, reflective means that integrate intellect and emotion in a procedure of imaginative inquiry. To be fully effective, this procedure demands a physical context that provides the most productive conditions. Think of a lookout on the, vast, on the edge of a vast canyon. For visitors to obtain the most comprehensive understanding of the view, the intellectual and psychological barriers to standing right at the edge of the cliff need to be sufficiently diminished such that the visitor is much more engaged with the view than with their insecurities in standing there. In some ways, this is like the museum. For viewers to engage in the most expansive procedure of inquiry and reflection, they must be placed in a situation where they are much more conscious of the work and its possibilities than of the condition of standing there. 
In both of these situations, one's intellect and emotions are sufficiently free to explore to the edges of the experience offered. In the museum, space, light, scale, distance, passage, atmosphere, sound, text, color, are among the many elements that are controlled to construct the ideal viewing context. Additional cues specific to each exhibition are also given so that everything that falls within the viewer's field of vision subtly returns the viewer back to the work and reinforce, reinforces its meanings. The most exciting and demanding strategy of the museum is the exhibition. In exhibitions, works are selected and sequenced so that the discourses and potential meanings of each one are interrelated in order to foreground important themes and propositions and to highlight the power and details of each by comparison between them. Researching and constructing exhibitions is not unlike researching and writing dissertations. With that in mind, those of us who work there are keenly interested in your ideas as they relate to critical visual discourse. The ideal situation for us is that almost every exhibition and program emerges from a relationship with you, the students, and the faculty. One of the exhibitions that is currently on display at the museum is the work of a recently graduated student in the humanities. As a student, Claire Dixon approached Marion Wardle, curator of American art at the museum, with a proposal for a research project focusing on the theoretical tensions between traditional and contemporary quilt making, hoping that Dr. Wardle would supervise it. Because of the significance of the research findings and with the assistance of a grant from the BYU Office of Research and Creative Activities, this project evolved to the point where now it is a fully developed exhibition with an important critical discourse on view at the museum. From a conversation more than two years ago with Marc Olivier, faculty member from the Department of French and Italian, the museum is well underway with the development of an exhibition that emerges from his research. The exhibition will explore the theory that new technology is introduced to society and its use is made palatable by embellishments in design that are nostalgic in character. This was true in the 18th century and it is true of recent technology. As a result of the research of Martha Peacock, faculty member in art history, previously promulgated discourses surrounding the interpretation of images of women in domestic settings in 17th century Dutch paintings are being questioned. The new interpretations, which have strong validity, will be presented in a spectacular exhibition of works drawn from some of the major collections of Europe. With ideas, discourses, values, and meaning as the principal focus of the museum, underwritten by the power of aesthetics, the mind and the heart are freed to be coupled in a unified, integrated, and relational search for that which is significant and important in life. In theory and over time, there are no bounds for that search in the museum. While some may come and simply bask in the dignity of fine works of art in the beautiful reflective spaces of the museum, its purpose is to provoke inquiry and to challenge thought. The museum's vision statement reads, the Museum of Art is a place where the heart and mind are brought together to seek knowledge and values, self-affirmation and spiritual understanding. We hope your experience in the museum will nurture a, re a more reflective mind, a capacity for deeper inquiry, a stronger commitment to excellence and integrity, and heightened appreciation for others and their ideas. I pose these questions. Can this process of viewing art in which we open our minds and hearts and search through ideas, contexts, references, assumptions, metaphors and feelings in order to make interpretations that yet remain open and contingent assist us in exploring the subtle and quiet prompting of the spirit, whether from prayer, from scripture, from the words of those ordained, ordained to lead us or any other worthy source? Does this more speculative procedure help us to leave ourselves open to recognizing that the Spirit's influence is many times more far-reaching and influential than often we let ourselves admit when we try to fix our interpretation of it? And does the process of holding our interpretations of the Spirit open in our hearts, pondering them further, lead us to recognize that its continual resonances slowly and quietly unfold even astounding ideas which increase our humility and produce great joy. I pray that it might, as I invite you to the Museum of Art. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.